Good evening and welcome to Heritage Baptist Church. Let's find our places, grab a songbook, turn to number 238. Number 238 in your songbooks. Let's all stand together as we sing, He Included Me. Number 238. I am so happy. Welcome one another this evening. our seats. We'll bring it in together on that third verse. Start again together on the third. Ever God's spirit is saying, come near the bright saying, no longer roam. But I am sure while they're calling home, Jesus included me too. Jesus included me. Yes, he included me when the Lord said, Praise the Lord. How many are tired? 
How many have been eating turkey leftovers? It's the tryptophan, I'm telling you right now. Uh, that stuff will put you to sleep every time. And that's what the joy of going away for Thanksgiving. You don't have any turkey leftovers. Uh, boy, what a, what a great, great day today. If you were here this morning, we had three folks join the church. If you stayed around, uh, Brother Rob had a young man uh, named Jason, 20-something, uh, that uh, visited, rode the bus for the very first time from Meriden this morning. And I think he was in the RU class, and then he went over to the Spanish service. And uh, a lot of folks had already gone, and Brother Martinez came up, said, we're going to have baptism. And Jason got saved and wanted to be baptized. And uh, so he got baptized uh, here this morning, about 1230 or so. And uh, so that was just, a, just an exciting end to the morning. And uh, then uh, one of the Filipino families, they dedicated, uh, they, they just bought a new home over on Durham Road. And uh, my wife and I were invited over and we feasted like kings. It was absolutely astounding. Uh, we went home with an entire cheese pizza. We went to a Filipino party and went home with a cheese pizza. And, uh, uh, but I mean, we went home with cannolis. At, from a Filipino party, uh, and uh, ziti and meatballs from a Filipino party. Uh, it was amazing, uh, just amazing food and, and, and fellowship, but two people got saved there this afternoon, and uh, we met a Spanish man that did all the remodeling from the house, and he got so excited when he found out that our Spanish pastor is from Mexico, and uh, he is leaving this week. He's going back to Mexico, uh, he's had cancer and some other things, and he's going back for some treatment. And uh, he is all excited when he comes back to come to our church and meet Brother Martinez. Uh, he's a saved man and so forth. So it's just been a, it's been a marvelous high. They're the ones that got saved. So praise the Lord. It's just been a great day. And I don't know if you noticed the angel tree is barren. Isn't that awesome? It started today. Every, how, many, how many were looking for an angel? I'm sorry, George, but you can buy me a present. Um, I'm excited about that. Thank you so much. Uh, that thing is taking off. Somebody, somebody is going a step further. They are buying an Xbox, and they're going to have a drawing for our bus kids on that day. And one of our bus kids is not going to go home with just the gift. They're going to go home with a brand new Xbox. Uh, then, then our church kids, all of our church kids, they're going to have a contest that day. They're going to have them come in and dress up on, uh, you know, their Christmas best and they're going to have a contest and, and they're going to give away some prizes for that. And it's just a thank you for just being so gracious and generous. And, uh, that's, that's exciting for our bus kids and, uh, praise the Lord for that. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for our church. And Lord, I know it's a holiday. We have dozens of dozens of people that are traveling. And Lord, I do pray your blessing upon them. We experienced some of that chaos yesterday. And Lord, just keep them safe. Keep them safe, whether they're driving, whether they're flying. Uh, Lord, whether they're traveling by bus or train. Lord, please, please keep them safe. But Lord, thank you for what you did this morning. Thank you for speaking to our hearts. Thank you for saving souls. Thank you for letting us see the waters of, uh, of baptism uh, be stirred. Thank you for adding to this church. Thank you for the wonderful spirit. Thank you for tonight and the opportunity to be in the Lord's house together. Lord, I pray that you'd meet with us. I pray that you would help us. I pray that you would encourage us in the things of the Lord. And Lord, for everything that you do, we'll be careful to thank and praise you. We pray these things tonight in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Keep your songbooks handy. Turn to number 16. Number 16 in your songbooks. It is no secret. Number 16. The chimes of time ring out the news. Another day is through. Someone slipped and fell. Was that someone you? You may have longed for had and strength, your courage to renew. Do not be disheartened, for I bring hope to you. It is no secret what God can do. What He's done for others, He'll do for you.
There is no night for in his light you'll never walk alone. Always feel at home wherever you may roam. There is no power can conquer you while God is on your side. Just take him at his promise. Don't run. Tennessee Ernie Ford. Anybody remember the name? Every time I hear that song, I think of Tennessee Ernie Ford. We had a record with him singing that song. How many know what records are? Yeah, a few of us remember those things. All right, moving on. A couple announcements. Wednesday night is our Bible study in the life of Joseph and also Patch the Pirate Club. We're back to the normal uh, schedule this week. And then Thursday night is our church decorating party. As you notice, the platform is as barren as can be. We don't like it that way. We're going to start at 630. Uh, if you can help us, teens and adults, uh, many hands make light work. And there's a this is a big place. We've got outside things to do, inside things to do. And uh, we're we're going with some different theme this year, uh, so uh, we need lots of help. And if you can help from 6.30 to 9 o'clock at any, any part of that time, uh, uh, every bit of help will, will be uh, uh, greatly appreciated. Tonight, right after the service, if we could have some men uh, bring the Christmas decoration boxes down and just put them in the ladies' uh, baptistry room. Uh, we're not, I guess, bringing the trees down tonight. Uh, but if we could get the other things, that would be a tremendous help uh, to us. Friday morning at 9 o'clock uh, will be the Young at Heart prayer meeting, meeting here in the auditorium. And then Saturday morning, 10 o'clock, is our soul winning meeting. And let me encourage you to come out and be a part of that. Uh, Sunday school teachers, your uh, Christmas lessons for the month of December uh, are out on the table in the hallway. Please make sure that you've picked those up uh, so that you're ready to go as uh, uh, December begins next Sunday. And uh, you're ready to go for that. Uh, teens this Friday, we'll be having Teen Soul Winning, 345. Uh, we'll meet upstairs in the high school chapel, so please be uh, on time for that. And then after that, it's starting at 630, going till 930 is our Teens of Faith activity. It's broom night this week, and we'll have a lot of fun. I'll uh, play some games with that. Uh, the cost is $2, and uh, the quiz is over Acts chapter 12, so make sure you're ready uh, for that as well. Uh, take your songbooks once again, if you would, please, and turn to number 423. Number 423 in your songbooks. Let's all stand once more as we sing, No One Ever Cared For Me Like Jesus. Number 423. I would love to tell you what I think of Jesus Since I found in Him a friend so strong and true I would tell you how He changed my life completely He did something that no other friend could do no one ever cared for me like Jesus. There's no other friend so kind as he. No one else could take the sin and darkness from me. Oh, how much he cared for me. All my life was full of sin when Jesus found Sin and darkness from me. Oh, how 
like Jesus. There's no other friend so kind as he. No one else could take the sin and darkness from me. Would you come and pray for tonight's offering, please? <clears throat> Father, as I was standing there and listening to the, the great music, I just want to praise you for uh, the women that constantly come forward and play our music for us. Thank you, Father, for uh, their sacrifice of service. I pray, Father, now that you would bless this offering, Father, use it for the furtherance of the gospel. Help us, Father, to be filled with your spirit as we hear the words you have for us tonight. Father, help us to leave here changed and on fire for you. The world needs lights, shining lights, sparkling lights. Help us to be that in Jesus' name. Amen. Bibles, please, and turn to Galatians chapter number six. Appreciate what Brother George said about our ladies and our musicians here. I've been in churches where the offertory is a time for everybody to just have a fellowship time and even during special music. And uh, people have practiced and prepared, and nobody gets blessed at all. And I'm glad our church is not like that. And uh, so I appreciate our ladies. Galatians chapter six tonight, we're going to read verses six through ten together. If you found that, well, let's stand for the reading of God's Word. It's a short portion of Scripture, so let's read all these verses together, please. Galatians chapter 6, beginning at verse 7, down through verse number 10. Beginning at verse 7. Be not deceived, God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. For he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. But he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. And let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. As we have therefore opportunity, let us do good unto all men, especially unto them who are of the household of faith. And let us pray together. Father, we have familiar verses in front of us tonight. And sometimes, Lord, with the familiar, we have a tendency to just treat them lightly to not take them as seriously as we ought to, and I pray the Holy Spirit would not allow us to do that tonight. May he open our eyes that we may behold wondrous, important things out of thy law. I pray, Lord, tonight that I might be a spirit-filled preacher and that I might be able to be a help to thy people. And for this help, we'll thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated.
Thank you, Michelle. If your Bibles are open tonight to Galatians chapter 6, we will be looking at a lot of scriptures, so please have your, your Bibles ready uh, to do that, please. Uh, the Bible says in verse number 9 of Galatians 6, in a very, very familiar verse, it says, And let us not be weary in, well do, in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. When I read this verse, I am reminded of an, of an event that occurred in 1 Samuel chapter 30. In that chapter, David and his mighty men had gone out and, and they were supposed to join with literally the Philistines in a battle, but God had arranged it and ordained it that they were to be separated and come back home to their city of Ziklag because the Philistines were actually going to go battle against Saul and the, the nation of Israel and God did not want David involved. When David and his men got to Ziklag, they found that in their absence, the Amalekites had come and they had ruined the city. They had burned it to the ground. All of their wives and their children had been captured and taken away, and uh, all of their goods were gone. The Bible says they sat down on the ground. They wept until they had no more power to weep. David's men were so discouraged, at one point they spake of stoning him. But you know there, the Bible says that David encouraged himself in the Lord. And, and David prayed and God said, go after them. Um, you're going you're gonna to recover everything. So the, the Bible teaches there that David and, and 600 of his men, they took off after these Amalekites. They found an Egyptian servant that had been left behind. He was sick. They left him behind to die, and he told them which way they went, and these 600 men took off. They came to a brook, a place called Besor, and at that brook, they, they, they uh, refreshed themselves just a little bit, got some water and so forth, but there were 200 of those soldiers. These were David's mighty men. The Bible says that they were so faint that they could not go on any further. And so they just left them, 200 soldiers and 400 men. Their army was already outnumbered. The Amalekites, was a, they were a massive uh, group of people. And so David's army went from 600 to 400 because 200 got physically weary to the point that not only could they not fight, they could no longer travel. So they left them behind, and those 400 now had to fight a battle that was already outnumbering 600 of them. Now God helped them, and God blessed them, and as Michelle just sang, our God specializes in things that we and others cannot do. God gave them a tremendous victory, but you understand the 400 were put in a position of taking up the slack because 200 got tired. And we do get physically tired sometimes, and that's what happened. Now, when we come to Galatians chapter number six, I do not necessarily believe that God is talking about a physical weariness, being physically tired. I think he's talking about becoming emotionally and mentally and spiritually tired. Let us not be weary in well-doing. Sometimes as we go through the Christian life and we're busy about the service of the Lord, is it not true that a weariness can settle over us? Sometimes it seems like it's one battle right after the other. And it's, 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 it's one need right after the other. We no sooner get take, done taking care of one thing and something else arises and it takes our attention. And it seems like we have very little time in between to catch our spiritual breath and we have to move on. And if we are not careful, we will become weary in well-doing. This is not the only time in the Bible where we are admonished to be careful of this and we're told not to be weary in well-doing. In 1 Corinthians 15, 58, in a different way, the Bible gives the same thing. Therefore, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as ye know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. 
There's this constant reminder in the scripture that that which we do for the Lord Jesus Christ is the most important thing that we do. And that we need to be careful that we don't become weary in that which we do. I'm reminded of Martha in Luke chapter number 10. How she was busy serving the Lord, but she lost her joy in that service. And in losing that joy, she was at odds with her sister. She was at odds with her Lord. And uh, it was a disaster for her. She became weary in in well-doing. And here's the thing. When we become weary in well-doing, it's only a matter of time until we join the 200 weary soldiers by the brook Besor and we will sit down and we will stop fighting. We will stop going forward, which means the rest who are serving are now taking up the slack and there are 400 that have to do the work of 600. And that means that they run the greater chance of becoming even more weary in well-doing and the work of God will suffer because we weren't careful with this admonition of scripture. How many understand and follow what I'm talking about? How many have been there? How many, how many, I've been there more than once. And that's why the Bible says, let us not be weary in well-doing. Now, we need to stop tonight and think for a moment or two, what are some things that cause Cause this to happen, that we become weary and well. I'm talking to Sunday school teachers. I'm talking to bus captains. I'm talking to staff members. uh, I'm I'm talking to to ushers, musicians. Uh, There's there's a lot that's placed on us. Uh, Everybody in this room, uh, the adults in this room, you work jobs. uh, You have families to raise. And we, we understand you have a life outside of these walls. And yet the Lord has called us to be a part of a church. And I'm glad that he did. And I'm glad that God's called us to be a part of this church. I I really am. God's doing some remarkable things. And we're part of the body of Christ. And God's gifted all of us. And God's gifted us for the purpose of serving. And not just spectating, but serving. But serving involves time, doesn't it? Serving involves investment of labor, investment of time, talent, and treasure. And and. To juggle an awful lot in the world in which we live. There are some parts of the country that are so laid back. Um, I'm thinking where Brother Wilson is now. He'll probably watch this live stream uh, and so forth. Uh, You know, he's he's in Missouri in farm country. Uh, How many have ever lived or grown up or whatever in farm country? It's a different world. It really is. You know, I go through the drive through I'm not going through the drive-thru to wait for them to make my food. I'm going through the drive-thru because I don't want to wait. There, you just talk about, hey, Joe, how y'all doing? What, how's Maggie? How are the kids? Really? Oh, your hog had a litter? And they're talking about all this stuff. And, you know, that food's the last thing on their mind. And, and uh, nobody, nobody but, you know, uh, time, is, time is not an issue. Here in the Northeast, time is a commodity that... You know, uh, we got too much to do. But if we're not careful when it comes to the things of God, we'll get weary in well-doing. So we need to stop and say, well, what causes it? Because you see, if we don't know the cause, it'll happen to us. And it might be too late. And all of a sudden, we're sitting over here by the brook Besor, and we're too faint to move on. And I don't want that to happen to me. And I don't want it to happen to you. Because what we do is too important. Number one, one of the things that will will cause us to get weary is thinking that we're the only ones. Thinking that we're the only ones. Turn your Bibles to 1 Kings chapter 19. 1 Kings 19. We won't spend a lot of time on all of these. 1 Kings 19, this is Elijah. He's just come off of Mount Carmel. Fire has fallen from heaven. The people have said, the Lord, he is the God. The Lord, he is the God. The prophets and priests of Baal have all been slaughtered. I mean, it's been an amazing thing. He's prayed and there's been rain that has come at the end of three and a half years. And of course, as soon as Jezebel heard everything that happened, instead of repenting, she just turned her sights on on, uh, Elijah and uh, put a contract out on his life. And this man that stood up against 800 false priests and prophets, this man that prayed down fire from heaven and then prayed down rain from heaven, verse number three, when he saw that, he arose and went for his life 
came to Beersheba, that's the southernmost border of the, of the land of Israel, which belongeth to Judah, and left his servant there. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a juniper tree, and he requested for himself that he might die and said, It is enough. Now, O Lord, take away my life, for I am not better than my father's. So he's discouraged and he's running as far away. He's not even in the land of, of Israel or Judah uh, anymore. An angel came and gave him some food, and, and uh, he just kept going. Verse number 8, he arose and did eat and drink and went in the strength of that meat 40 days and 40 nights unto Horeb, the Mount of God. This is where Moses got the Ten Commandments. This is Mount Sinai, uh, if you will. And he came thither unto a cave and lodged there. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, and he said unto him, What doest thou here, Elijah? And he said, I have been very jealous for the Lord God of hosts. For the children of Israel have forsaken thy covenant, thrown down thine altars, and slain thy prophets with the sword. And I, even I only am left, and they seek my life to take it away. Here's Elijah, mighty man of God, and notice he's, he's been faithful. He really has. And uh, he makes this statement. He said, I, even I only am left. I'm the only one. I'm the only one that serves you. Verse 11, the Lord just put on a display for him. The Lord passed by. There was a strong wind that break the rocks. Uh, there was an earthquake. Then there was a fire. And after the fire, there was a still small voice. And it was so when Elijah heard that, he wrapped his face. And uh, the Lord spoke to him again in verse uh, 13. What doest thou here, Elijah? And he repeated everything word for word. I, even I only am left. And they seek my life to take it. And then God had a few things to say to him. And I want you to notice what God had to say at the verse number 18, the very last thing God said. Yet I have left me 7,000 in Israel, all the knees which have not bowed unto Baal, and every mouth which hath not kissed him. Here's Elijah serving God, and somehow he got it into his head. He was the only one. He was the only one. And God said, Elijah, I've got 7,000. Just because you didn't see them didn't mean they're not there. Just because you didn't, didn't, didn't hear from them doesn't mean that there's nobody else that believes like you. We live in difficult days. Uh, people are changing. Churches are changing. Churches are changing fast. They're taking an easier route. They're taking an easier route. Uh, it, it, it's, it's getting a little harder to, to stand for what churches used to stand for. There used to be a day every church believed what we believe. And there used to be a day when the Presbyterians believed what we believe. Now there's a lot of independent Baptists don't believe what we believe. And, and uh, why? Because uh, people don't want to hear that. If we just say, hey, look, it doesn't matter if you come to church or not. We'll just give you Sunday school class. We'll make you a deacon. You can do all this kind of stuff. Man, we could have a big church. We can put the praise team up here. We can put the band up here. Uh, we, we, can, we, can let, we can have uh, uh, all the staff wives up here in their skinny jeans and the whole nine yards. We can just drop all our standards and throw everything out the window. We can compromise on everything. We can, we can draw a crowd, but we wouldn't honor God. We wouldn't honor God's word. Churches are changing. Uh, by the way, there are a dime a dozen, but that's not what God's called us to do. God's called us to stand. Um, I remember when I was in Bible college way back in the 70s, I remember Dr. Hiles, and he was, he was younger than I am now, saying that the older he got, the lonelier he got. He said, because one of two things kept happening. Either everybody changed or everybody was passing away. And over the next couple of decades, as I listened to him preach, he kept making that statement. Uh, by the 90s, I, I kept hearing him all the time uh, just making that statement. He said, it's getting lonelier and lonelier. He said, so many have changed, so many have changed. People that used to come and preach in chapel when I was at House Anderson, he couldn't have them anymore because they'd utterly changed their stand on the Bible, their stand on everything, because it, it was all about uh, making the world happy and all that kind of stuff. And he just said, I can't change the Bible is what the Bible is. The Bible says what the Bible says, and I'm going to stand there. But we got to understand this. We aren't the only ones that believe the King James Bible. We're not the only ones that believe like that. We got we to be reminded you're not alone. 
You're not alone. Sometimes when you're out knocking on doors, I know there's nobody walking around applauding you as you go around, but, but understand this. You're not the only one that's passing out tracts. If you are, then please explain why we're ordering tracts by the hundreds and the hundreds and the thousands during the year. Are you passing out thousands of tracts every year? If so, awesome. Keep it up. But I don't think you are. I, there, I, I, get, I get texts from people all, all week long. Hey, I won somebody at my place of business. Hey, I won somebody at the store. There are people going soul winning that you don't even see, that you don't even know about. I know we got a list in the hallway of people that won souls this year, but there's a bunch of people that won souls this year that just said, I'd rather not put my name out on the list, and I'm A-OK -okay with that. We're not alone in this thing. we got to get away from the mentality, I'm the only one. Elijah I just fell prey to that and it wore him down to think I'm all by myself. Hey, look around. Look around at all the people that love God. It's a Sunday night on a holiday weekend. And these are the people that are faithful and loyal to their own church that are in the house of God. We are not alone. Be careful that you don't let your mind go astray. Something else that'll, that'll get you weary and well doing. Luke chapter number 10, not spending time with Jesus. Not spending enough time with Jesus. I alluded to this a moment ago, Luke chapter number 10. And let me see, I want you in verse, <clears throat> verse number 39. Came to pass as they went that he entered into a certain village. And a certain woman named Martha received him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary, which also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. But Martha was cumbered about much serving, came to him and said, Lord, dost thou not care that my sister hath left me to serve alone? Bid her therefore that she help me. And Jesus answered and said unto her, Martha, Martha, thou art careful and troubled about many things, but one thing is needful. Mary hath chosen that good part, which shall not be taken away from her. One thing is needful. What's that one thing that is necessary? It's sitting at the feet of Jesus. That's the one thing that's necessary. Jesus, what Jesus is saying, I can do without supper, but I can't do without you. Sometimes we get so busy. Thank you, Brother Tim. Sometimes we get so busy in the service of the Lord that we forget about the Lord that we're serving. If you're a workaholic, that can happen to you. Sometimes we, we take things, let's, let's look at it this way. The 200 fall by the wayside, and that happens. So the 400 have to pick up the slack. Let, let's, just, let's just talk about the elephant in the room. We've had 11 families move away this year. I'm not talking about those who fell away. I'm talking about those who moved away. Florida, California, they all go, always go somewhere warm. What's the deal with that? The Huffs were bus captains. The Meningdings were three times a week people. Lily, man, Lily was so faithful in the Filipino. She was three times a week. And on and on we could go in, on, on that list of people. And, and they, were, they were busy and they were active and they were, they were here. And, and they didn't sit by the Brook Beast or they, they moved away. But what that meant is all of a sudden a bunch of other people had to add on to some of their responsibilities. When we ran out of a, out of a bus route, I, I was praying about a bus captain. To be honest, I wasn't thinking about him. He's a full-time staff member. I know how many hours he puts in because he lives with me. I, I already know that. He came to me, he and Anna walked down one night and came to me very emotionally. God wants us to take the bus route. I, I didn't pressure. I, I would have I, never done that. And he, he took a bus route. Took a bus route. Hap, happy to do that. He's got twins coming. And he's, he's, he's got a bus route. He's got the youth. He's got the music. He's got the school. He cleans our building. And, and, and all of those things. And, and he's, he's just one. M Mrs. Reamers is a jobaholic. She's like a magnet for lost jobs. It's, it's the most amazing thing I've ever seen. 
If, if there's a job run, it's boom, right there. Mrs. Reavers has got it. Mrs. Clack, she's got the same disease. And there's a whole bunch of people around here. And I praise God for every one of them. But that can, that can be a very, very dangerous thing that if you get too busy, you get too busy. And you aren't taking time with that Bible and a cup of tea or a cup of coffee in a very, very quiet place. And there's no noise. You get to hear that still, small voice. Because that's where you get your strength. That's where you get your perspective. Because if... if, if if this stays closed, it's only a matter of time till you will be so faint that you'll stop by the brook be sore and somebody else will have to go fight your battle. I have been there. I have been there and it's, it's a terrible place to be. Number three, turn to John chapter 21. John chapter 21. By the way, those ladies, Brother Rob, these people that I mentioned, I'm not at all saying anything negative about them. I'm so blessed to have them and people like them all over this room that just do so much to serve the Lord. I just don't want you to ever, ever lose your joy in that which you do. John chapter 21, the third thing that can get us weary is focusing what everybody else ought to do. We never do that, so we probably don't have to spend a lot of time on this. Um, in John chapter 21, it's after the resurrection and it's before Christ ascends to heaven. And the Lord is speaking to Peter. And, you know, of course, he, Peter, you know, uh, in verse 15, Simon, uh, son of Jonas, lovest thou me uh, more than these. And, and that happened about three times. And then the Lord says in verse 18, verily, verily, I say unto thee, when thou wast young, thou girdest thyself and walkest whither thou wouldest. When you were a young man, you just, you did what pretty much whatever you wanted. He said, but when thou shalt be old, he's giving a prophecy now, thou shalt stretch forth thine hands and another shall gird thee and carry thee whither thou wouldest not. This spake he, signifying by what death he should, glor uh, should glorify God. Peter was crucified uh, according to the annals of history. Uh, they say that when the time came, Peter uh, requested that he be crucified upside down because he was not worthy to be crucified in the same manner as his Lord. Um, and when he had spoken this, he saith unto him, follow me. So Peter has just received this solemn word from Christ that this is going to happen to him out there in the future. Peter should have been focusing on that. Uh, if any, if there were at anything at that moment, Peter saying, Lord, is there anything I need to do to prepare? Uh, Lord, are you sure? Lord, Lord, uh, you know, I failed you before. How, how do I make sure I don't fa that, That's the kind of questioning the thoughts that are about Peter's mind. Look at verse 20. Then Peter... Turning about, seeth the disciple whom Jesus loved following, that's the apostle John, which also leaned on his breast at supper and said, Lord, which is he that betrayeth thee? Peter, seeing him, saith to Jesus, Lord, and what shall this man do? Isn't that amazing? He, he just got told, Peter, there's going to come a day you're going to be crucified. That's how you're going to glorify me in your death. And Peter said, well, what's John going to do? You know, we're, we get too busy worrying about what everybody else is supposed to do. And that will mess us up. Because guess what? <laughs> it's none of your business. Did you hear me say that? <laughs> it ain't none of your business. That's between them and God. But, 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 no. And by the way, that's what Jesus said. Jesus saith unto him, if I will that he tarry till I come, what is that to thee? Say, so what does that mean? It's none of your business, Peter. Follow thou me. Peter, you do what I told you. You follow me. Don't worry about John. Don't worry about him. It, it, it'll be taken care of. Sometimes we're too worried about what everybody else is doing or not doing. It'll mess us up and we'll wear ourselves out. Number four. Number four. Turn to 2 Timothy chapter 4. This can be a real struggle. We can get weary with the failings and the falling away of others. These are the last words that the apostle Paul penned under divine inspiration. Verse number nine, Paul says, do thy diligence to come shortly unto me. He's writing to Timothy. For Demas 
hath forsaken me. He wrote about Demas in the book of Philemon. He was a companion, a, sir, a fellow, a laborer with him. Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world, and is departed unto Thessalonica, Cretans to Galatia, Titus unto Dalmatia. Only Luke is with me. Take Mark and bring him with me, with thee, for he is profitable to me for the ministry. And Tychicus have I sent to Ephesus. The cloak that I left at Troas with Carpus, when thou comest, bring with thee, and the books, but especially the parchments. Alexander the coppersmith did me much evil. The Lord reward him according to his works. Of whom be thou ware also, for he hath greatly withstood our words. At my first answer, he's talking about standing before Nero. At my first answer, no man stood with me, but all men forsook me. I pray God that it may not be laid to their charge. Notwithstanding, the Lord stood with me and strengthened with me that by me the preaching might be fully known and that all the Gentiles might hear and I was delivered out of the mouth of the lion. And the Lord shall deliver me from every evil work and will preserve me unto his heavenly kingdom to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. In this amazing little book of the Bible, Paul laments about those who've gone away. Demas is out of the ministry, totally. He's forsaken, he's backslid, he's out in the world. He's out in the world. For some reason, he chose Thessalonica. We don't know why, but he's gone. A man by the name of Cretans, Cretans has gone to Galatia, and Titus has gone to Dalmatia. We don't know if these two men have backslidden. Uh, we don't know if he sent them away. Maybe they're ministering there. We're, we're not sure about that. The only companion he's got with him is Luke. But a little bit later, he talks about the fact that when he stood before Nero, even Luke forsook him. Luke, the guy that penned the gospel of Luke, the man who penned the book of Acts. Luke just forsook him. He wanted nothing to do with him. And so Paul had to stand there all by himself. Nobody there to, as a character witness, nobody there to help him, to, to stand for him. Everybody forsook him. And uh, Paul, had to, Paul had to write about that. Paul had to lament about that. And the failings and the falling away of other people can hurt us. Those of you that teach Sunday school classes that build bus routes, that, by the way, the ministry is all about people. It really is. It's all about people. If you build a business, it's all about money. It, it really is. I don't care what the business is, whether it's computers or shoes. It, it's really all about making money. At the end of the, end of the day, it's, it, it's did you make a profit or did you suffer a loss? But the ministry, it's not about that. Oh, you can build big buildings and have all of that, but at the end of the day, it, it's all about did you touch anybody's life? Did you, it, it's all about people. When my wife and I first moved to New York uh, 32 years ago, uh, we were there about a month, and our church hosted a big meeting. Dr. Hiles was coming in uh, as the preacher. Uh, we were in a little a white wood frame church building in a little town that could never handle the crowd. So we used a, a church building. It was the Calvary Hill Baptist Church. Uh, it was about a half an hour away. It literally set up in a hill, and it was an amazing structure. Um, uh, it was it was a fairly new building in our church. Man, we could we could do so much if we had this this facility. And we had hundreds and hundreds of people from the Rochester area that came and, and were was a part of that. Our choir sang, and, and it was just amazing. But but this church had a building to die for. But they had about fifty people. They had services where they were raising sixty and seventy thousand dollars a service just to keep up with either the mortgage payment or the utility bills, and eventually it just went under. I believe it's a Buddhist temple today. They had facilities, but they they, they had no people. The ministry is not about buildings. Some of the people from that church because the church folded its doors, came to, to our church and so forth. And I remember one man in particular telling me, he said, we were better off when we were in just this little tiny rickety building. He said, something changed. We got this big building and we just lost it all. It wasn't, it, it wasn't the same. The ministry is about people. When you invest in people and then they turn their back on you, you invest in people, they go out into the world. You invest in people, 
and they stab you in the back. Remember Jeremiah this morning? He, he delivered that amazing message of hope from Jeremiah 18. And then they said, we're going to destroy him with our words. That was their response. We'll destroy him with our words. That can get you weary and well-doing. By the way, Jeremiah, a chapter or two later, said, Lord, I want to quit. I just want to quit. There's another thing that will cause us to get weary and well-doing. Ecclesiastes 3, and I'm almost done. Ecclesiastes 3. And this list is probably not all-inclusive, but I think it's probably inclusive enough. Another reason we get weary in well-doing, we don't understand the seasons. Galatians 6 said, let us not be weary in well-doing, for we shall reap in due season if we faint not. Ecclesiastes 3, verse 1, to everything there is a season and a time to every purpose under the heaven. A time to be born and a time to die. A time to plant and a time to pluck up that which is planted. A time to kill and a time to heal. A time to break down and a time to build up. A time to weep and a time to laugh. A time to mourn and a time to dance. A time to cast away stones and a time to gather stones together. A time to embrace, that's called marriage, and a time to refrain from embracing, that's called being a teenager time to get and a time to lose, time to keep and a time to cast away, time to rend and a time to sow, time to keep silence and a time to speak, a time to love and a time to hate, time of war and a time of peace. There's a season for everything. There's a season to everything. Look at Psalms chapter 74. Psalm 74, we shall reap in due season if we faint not, Psalm 74, verse number 17. <clears throat> Asaph, the psalmist says here that in verse 17, thou hast set all the borders of the earth, thou hast made summer and winter. Thou hast made summer and winter. If I was God, I would not have made winter. Is that okay? Anybody else with me on that? Mrs. Clack definitely is not with me on that. She's so glad I'm not God. Um, I, I, the older I get, the less I, the less I need winter. Uh, we're, we're not even done completely raking leaves in our yard, and it's almost time to start shoveling stuff. Uh, I, I, don't, I don't really care for winter uh, and all, but God ordained it. God ordained it from the creation of the world. And even after the flood, God ordained that, that, uh, that uh, the seasons were to be, that, that winter and, and summer and, and spring and harvest and all of that, God ordained all of those things. Those seasons are put there by God. And in, in the Bible says to everything, in life there are seasons. And in ministry there are seasons. Uh, I read this by Charles Spurgeon. Uh, on this subject of, of seasons, listen care, carefully to this. My soul, begin this wintry month with thy God. This is for the month of December in a devotional that he wrote. My soul, begin this wintry month with thy God. The cold snows and the piercing winds all remind thee that he keeps his covenant with day and night and tends to assure thee that he will also keep that glorious covenant which he has made with thee in the person of Christ Jesus. He is true to... who. He who is true to his word in the revolutions of the seasons of this poor, sin-polluted world will not prove unfaithful in his dealings with his own well-beloved son. Winter in the soul is by no means a comfortable season. And if it be upon thee just now, it will be very painful to thee. But there is this comfort, namely, that the Lord makes it. He sends the sharp blast of adversity to nip the bud of expectation. He scattereth the hoarfrost like ashes over the once green meadows of our joy. He casteth forth his ice like morsels freezing the streams of our delight. He does it all. He is the great winter king 
and rules in the realms of frost, and therefore thou canst not murmur. Losses, crosses, heaviness, sickness, poverty, and a thousand other ills are of the Lord's sending and come to us with wise design. Frosts kill noxious insects and put a bound to ranging diseases. They break up the clods and sweeten the soul. Oh, what such good results would always follow our winters of affliction. How we prize the fire just now. How pleasant is its cheerful glow. Let us in the same manner prize our Lord, who is the constant source of warmth and comfort in any time of trouble. Let us draw nigh to him and in him find comfort in, in every, uh, find joy and peace in believing. Let us wrap ourselves in the warm garments of his promise and go forth to labors which befit the season. For it were ill to be as the sluggard who will not plow by reason of the coal, for he shall beg in summer and have nothing. God sends the seasons. God sends the seasons. I read in another place, Spurgeon said churches go through seasons and sometimes churches go through a winter season. He said, but that's all right. Because the winter season promises that spring just around the corner. And see, if we fail to understand that, we just stop, we just stop serving. We get weary in well-doing. And the Bible says, let's not do that. So what do we do instead? Let me give you three statements and we'll be done. Number one, renew thy strength. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew thy strength. Be like a Mary and sit at the feet of Jesus frequently. Spend great time at the feet of Christ. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Number two, would you remember thy Savior? Don't get so lost in the service of the Savior that you forget the Savior that you serve. This Thursday night is you decorate the church auditorium. You ought to ask yourself every step of the way, I hope Jesus likes this. I hope this is something that will please him. As we decorate to honor and remember the birth of Christ, boy, I hope he likes it. As you practice the songs for the Christmas service, you ought to ask yourself, not will the church like this or will my parents like this or will my guests like this, but will this please the Lord? Remember the Savior in all that you do. Don't do it for a number. Don't do it for a prize. Don't do it for a, 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 an, an attaboy or a pat on the back. Just remember the Savior. Remember the Savior. Paul said in Philippians chapter 3, he said, everything that I have and everything that I've done, he said, I, I count them all but dung that I may win Christ. That's all I want. Re renew thy strength. Remember thy Savior. Rededicate thy service. Rededicate thy service unto thee, O Lord. All that I do, Lord, it's unto thee. Sometimes it becomes about us, doesn't it? It becomes about us. Well, I'm doing, isn't that what Elijah did? I did this and I stood and I did this and I'm the only one. Did you know how many times he used the pronoun I and it should have been you? Elijah prayed the prayer, but God sent the fire. Elijah prayed the prayer, but God sent the rain. When, when you think about it, Elijah couldn't make fire come from heaven on his own if he tried for the rest of his life. It was all God, but he got that pronoun I in there. Look, look, folks, we can't do anything. It's all God. It's just all God. We couldn't manufacture this morning if we tried. That's just all God. And we need to make sure that our service is just all about him. I appreciate the people of our church more than you know. You, you have no idea. Uh, there's, there's, there's not a week goes by that I just don't thank the Lord for, for the people of this church. I thank the Lord for the nursery workers and the bus workers and the ushers. Brother George, you were gone one Wednesday night. I, I think you were sick. And nobody was sitting at that back door. I had a migraine. I barely got through the, the Wednesday night Bible study. Trina and I were sitting over here praying. My head was about to explode. We were, we were praying and people were leaving. 
and that they, the, they just opened the door and they went out and the door was slamming. When you're sitting there and people leave, you must put your arm out and make sure that the door just closes. Am I right? It was bam, bam, bam. You asked my wife, dear Lord, make those people stop slamming the door. I know this sounds stupid, but do you know how much I thank the Lord that you're back there making sure the door doesn't slam? Because really, it's not stupid. Because sometimes I have a headache and it drives me nuts. I, there's, there's so many, so many hundreds of things. Let the critics yap till their faces fall off. The sooner the better. There are too many people around here who do so much for God. But I don't want any of us to ever get so tired and weary in well-doing that we have to sit down by the brook be sore. Because you've got so much to do for God. There's so much battle left. But if, but if Brother Rob gets weary in well-doing, somebody else has to fight his battle. But they're already fighting their own. Do you see how it gets bad? We, we've, we've got a cause, and we've got a Savior. And he says, you don't have to do it alone. You don't have to do it alone. Father, I pray that tonight we'll give thought to this. Lord, I have been here so many times. Sometimes I'm physically tired, and that's okay. I, I can deal with that. But Lord, sometimes, sometimes my heart is tired. My heart is tired. Sometimes I just get tired of the battle. Sometimes, Lord, I've sat on the platform and I just get tired being glared at. Sometimes, Lord, it just seems like it's from one big moment to the next and there's just so much to do. But Lord, it's what you've called me to do. And it's a privilege to serve. And there's a burden about it, but Lord, you, you could have let the angels do this, but you've let me do this. Lord, I don't want to fail you. I don't want to let you down. Lord, I pray that you would help me not be weary and well-doing, and tonight I'm not. Tonight I'm glad to serve you. Glad to serve God's people. But Lord, I know there are times. There's times I've wanted to sit down by the brook be sore. Let somebody else fight the fight. And Lord, I don't think I'm alone in that. Lord, I pray for God's people. I thank you for God's people. Lord, I pray that tonight you would help us. Help us to renew our strength. Lord, it may be that the great servants just aren't spending the time in the presence of the Savior the way that we should. We're more like Martha than we are like Mary. And Lord, I pray that tonight you would help us. Lord, it may be that there are some that are sitting by the brook Besor that ought not be sitting there. They're not tired. They just haven't got in the fight. And they ought to be picking up the load and helping out so that some of those that are carrying so much and get some help. And Lord, I pray that if that be the case, that you would stir them, and they would step up to the plate and say, here I am. Here I am. Well, thank you for our church. You've got a plan for us. You've got a plan for us. I pray that we won't let you down. On this corner, this church has stood as a lighthouse for over three decades, and I pray that we'll just be shining until Jesus comes. Help us not to be weary and well-doing. Bless the invitation tonight. Encourage our hearts. I pray in Jesus' name. With our heads bowed and our eyes closed, would you just stand? The altar's here tonight. If God's spoken to your heart, you may be weary and well-doing. You may not be. But maybe something in the course of the message spoke to you. As Ms. Edward just plays a song of invitation. Why don't you come tonight and just say, Lord... Could you help me with this? Could you help me with this? 
it happens to the best of servants. If it happened to Elijah, Martha was a great, dear lady, and it happened to her. It happened to Peter. And even Paul got a little sad and discouraged there at the end, left all by himself. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. not be weary in well-doing for in due season we shall reap if we faint not who knows what God's going to do in the life of some of these bus riders the overwhelming display of love that's going on right now towards them in this Christmas season who knows how that's going to affect some of these kids it might change it might change a life forever we've got one bus kid in college right now there might be a whole bunch more in the years to come let's not be weary in well doing Sunday school teacher you think nobody's listening but you might be surprised don't, don't get weary in well doing don't you, don't you quit don't you quit Father help us it's been a good day to be in the Lord's house thank you for those who've been saved today thank you for Jason's baptism Thank you for those that you added to this church. Thank you for the miracles we saw this morning. Miracles we saw. Lord, if anybody in the ministry was, has been discouraged lately, maybe weary in well-doing, seeing someone come back to God like we saw this morning, Lord, that just changes everything. It says it's worth it all. It says it's never too late. God's still working, and we're so thankful. Lord, dismiss us safely to our homes tonight. Help our folks get a good rest. Lord, school's tomorrow. Everybody goes back to work. We've got a lot of folks traveling tonight. Would you please keep them safe? Bring us back Wednesday night for the service. Thursday night, fellowshipping, serving together, getting the auditorium church decorated for Christmas, all the work of these next weeks for the Christmas season. Just bless it. May it be a joyful time in our church, and we'll thank you for this. We pray these things tonight in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. You're dismissed. Greet one another before you go home tonight. Christmas decorations down. I think Brother Rob may have already gone.